Would you like to become a fascinating personality, break free from plateaus and gain power over your mental resources and your full potential? You came to the right place. Welcome to a magical journey to yourself. This show is made in Germany. If you like the show, please subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or PureMindMagic.club. Welcome to Season 1, Shaping Your Reality. And here is your host, international magician, speaker, and book author, Victoria Mavis. gentlemen welcome to a new episode of the pure mind magic podcast i'm happy that you have tuned in again today it's all about influence success and wealth and i have on the show achievement mindset trainer ron malhotra he is the number one best-selling author award-winning wealth expert, international speaker, and the CEO and founder of the successful Male Global and Thought Leaders Institute. So this is going to be a very interesting interview you won't miss. But before we start, I have a hot magic tip for you when you are in the same position as me, looking to expand your virtual team to get even more done in a day while you focus on your core tasks. To enhance your productivity, I found a really cool platform because I just returned from UK, London, and this platform is based in UK and you can find people there and hire them per hour. So a really cool tool and I'm going to put the direct invitation for you in the show notes. With that, you get 30 pounds off your first booking there. I think it's really cool. So give it a try. And now we start right away with this fantastic interview today with Ron Maholtra. Hi, Ron. How are you today? Hi, I'm doing very well. Thank you. How are you? Good. So, Ron, where are you based at the moment? I live in Melbourne, Australia, which is uh, on the other side of the planet from you. <laughs> I think, um, and uh, Melbourne was, uh, for those that may not know, Melbourne was voted the most livable city in the world. Uh, for seven years, and uh, we're experiencing a, a very uh, cold season at the moment because we're in, we're right in the midst of winter in Melbourne. Oh, okay. So here it is summer over in Germany, but it's great to talk to someone from the other side, like we say, down under. And thanks to podcasting, that is all possible. So Ron, maybe to start, because you are such a charismatic and interesting personality. I have the feeling I could talk to you for the rest of the day. But for the listeners who don't know you yet, can you give us a brief of description of who you are and what you do? please? Well, I think um, people ask me this question because a lot of people struggle to understand what I do, but really I'm just a teacher. And how I've chosen to uh, teach is through speaking, consulting, writing, training, um, and, and running movements. But really, in my heart, I'm a teacher. Uh, in my mind, I'm an entrepreneur. And in my spirit, I'm a leader. And what I teach is effectively everything that I teach my, comes under one philosophy, and that is I help people magnify their lives. So primarily I do that with, through the vehicles of mindset, money, influence, success, and performance. Uh, those are the vehicles through which, which I help people magnify their lives. And really, if you had to say, Ron, what is your underlying philosophy in life? I would say be more, do more, have more. I'm the more guy. I'm not the less guy. So um, I'm always hungry for more, um, and it's not about greed. Uh, I'm very much about wanting to know exactly what my true potential is, 
And I'm one of those guys that wants to be completely used up by the time I'm dead. So, um, you know, and, I, and anyone that comes into my uh, sphere of influence uh, is somebody that has to be ambitious by default, because if they're not ambitious, they're not going to like me. Hmm, I like that. So this is a very clear approach uh, on what you do and a good description about it. So it's action, action, action. And it's what they say on film sets to get the scene rolling. It's action again. So Ron, can you give us a description of some success principles? Well, certainly, I think it One of the things that I realized was, um, I'll just give you some background. So I come from the money world. I've been in uh, wealth management for a number of years. Uh, so I've spent 17 years talking to people about money. And money is one of those subjects that most people are not very comfortable talking about. But money is also one of those subjects that when you really people start to talk to people about their money situation, you start to really get insights into how they think. And what happened with me was I was just, you know, assisting people with their money decisions. And over a period of time, I started to identify patterns in their thinking to the point that after I had done it for a number of years, after five or 10 minutes of speaking to a person, I could see identifiable patterns and I could predict with great certainty what their financial position is and where they're going to end up. Now, this was really interesting because nobody in the finance world was talking about the connection between psychology um, and net worth, most people will just make the assumption that if you have a lot of money, that if you have a lot of strategies and you invest well, that you're going to become wealthy. Very few people have actually made the, the connection between psychology and behaviors and the amount of wealth that you create. Now, when I made the connection, I was absolutely certain that there was a, there was a link. I started to then find out that there was a couple of fields like behavioral uh, finance and neuroeconomics, which had done some research. Now, this started to whet my appetite to learn more about the human psychology. So I started to delve into traditional psychology, neuroscience, epigenetics, sociology, theology, philosophy, uh, metaphysics. And what I wanted, was trying to do, which I didn't know at the time, was I was trying to find a definite connection between how people think and the circumstances that they produce for their lives. Because the vast majority of people think that their circumstances come first. But I was convinced that the circumstances didn't come first. What came first was how they think. Now, when I say this at events, sometimes people say to me, but Ron, are you telling me that that car accident that happened to me is my fault? Are you telling me that the fact that I got molested as a child is my fault? Are you telling me that my boss doesn't pay me enough money? Is that my fault? And I go, no, that's not what I'm saying. First of all, let's not use the language of blame and fault. But I am saying that in the short term, things can happen to you that are out of your control. But in the long term, you're always responsible, not to be blamed. You're always responsible for the circumstances that you're in. Now, this, this is something that really confuses people. But then I show them how they got into the circumstances that they're in. So for me, the ultimate determinant of success is to understand How your mind works, because you have a very, very powerful tool. As human beings, we're very lucky. We're the only species that has this kind of brain, but most of us have no idea how to use it. So if you're going to become highly successful, you need to know how you work. And if you don't know how you work, you're not going to understand how other people work. You don't understand how other people work. You're not going to understand how the world works. And you're just going to live a very confused life. So for me, the clarity came in when I understood that the biggest contributor to your success was clarity. The more clear you are on who you are, how you work, what you want, the more clear you are on why you're here, the better decisions you're going to make and the better decisions you make, the better outcomes you get in life. Hmm, that is so impressive, Ron, and makes so much sense, all the knowledge you collected there from psychology. So could you share with us some tips and tricks to work with the mind and shift the mindset? Well, the first thing I always say to people is that because I get a lot of people who say, can you give me some tips on money? Can you give me some tips on entrepreneurship or can you give me some tips on influence of my mind? And I go, first thing is the first tip I'm going to give you is get away from tips. And people go, what do you mean? And I go, well, the problem with tips is that tips can never make cause transformation. The only thing that will cause transformation is an understanding of the principles and laws. And the reason is very simple. If you do not understand the principles, but you understand the tips, you will still not be able to apply the tips. So you've always got to start with the principles and laws. There are some principles and laws that govern everything. 
There are principles of business. There are principles of money. There are principles of life. There are principles of success. You've got to start with the principles. So if you bypass the principles and you go into strategies or you go into tactics or you go into tips, the problem will always be you don't have context. And I always say one of the most dangerous things today in this world today now where we're bombarded with information is that content without context doesn't make sense. You've got to have context first. So I will try and answer. This is not me trying to deviate from the question, but what I'm trying to do right now for your listeners is try to produce some context first. Because it's very simple. If you don't understand why you're doing what you're doing, you're not going to do it. Now, when people say, I want a tip, what they're basically saying is, Ron, tell me how I can just land on top of the mountain without climbing. <laughs> well, that's not possible, right? So you've got to, what you've got to do is you've got to fall in love with the process. You've got to master the process. When you master the process, the results come automatically. If you engage in the cause, the effects take care of themselves. If you aim for the effect, you'll never master the cause. And that's the issue. So there is fundamentally, we, what we're finding is that there is a flaw in the way people think, and there is a flaw in how people are learning things. And what it's doing is it's creating a massive illusion of knowledge. Today, anyone can go on Facebook and find some motivational and inspirational messages. Anybody today can espouse to know something by sharing messages. But what is the ultimate truth? Well, the ultimate truth is one that stood the test of time that has been applied across various countries, across various centuries by various scholars, philosophers, scientists, and has produced consistency of outcomes. That is the truth. Because And so what's happening today is in a world which is in the social age where information is shared so freely and quickly, people are more confused than ever before. They have more information than ever before, but they have less wisdom than ever before. So the reason why you have to go back to principles and laws is because that's what gi that's gives you wisdom. It un makes you understand that this piece of information is relevant in these circumstances, but not relevant in other circumstances. If you don't have that, you're going to confuse yourself. So let's just talk about, you know, one of the first, before we go into the answers, we have got to ask ourselves the right questions. So the first and the most important question in the world is, what am I? And I know that people might go, oh my God, Ron, this guy is so deep and intense and uh, where are we going? This is all sounding very esoteric and spiritual. It's not. Ask yourself, what are you? Can you answer that question? Uh, people say, I'm a human being. Well, that's what you were told. But what are you really? What does that mean? Second question you want to ask yourself is, who am I? Who am I? Are you your name? Well, you, 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 did you pick your name? Are you your occupation? Well, did you pick your occupation or was it a product of media and cultural conditioning? Are you your nationality? Did you pick your nationality? Are you your religion? Did you pick your religion? Are you your culture? Did you pick your culture? If the answer is no to all of them, then the question is, who are you? And who you are must be defined by your purpose, your passion, your strengths, your values, your mission, and your goals. Now, here is the problem. The majority of people can tell you their name, their occupation, their nationality, their culture, and their religion. But they would struggle to tell you what they're passionate about. They would struggle to tell you what their strengths are. They would struggle to tell you what their values are. They would struggle to tell you their purpose, and they would struggle to tell you their goals. It is no wonder that majority of people in the world fail in being able to craft and design the exact life that they want because, going back to what I said earlier, they have no clarity. So it has to start with clarity and it has to start with you. The other issue is now you've got a world. I mean, if, I don't know if you know the statistics around it. So we're looking at statistics. So we've got uh, a better lifestyle than ever before. Today, we have more technology than ever before. We have, we have the ability to be able to connect with anyone. But despite that, we are seeing rates of depression, anxiety, violence, substance abuse, all on the rise. Bankruptcy and business failures. Why is that? Because information doesn't cause transformation. What causes transformation is insights. And that's what people are missing. So one of the things, and the reason I'm talking about this is because if you, people have to understand, if people, if the question is, well, how do I become successful? You've got to first understand what will not make you successful. And what will not, will not make you successful is just going and seeking a lot of information, but not knowing what to do with it. 
Yes, that makes so much sense. And I can relate to that with magic as well, because sometimes people say when they see illusions on stage, oh, I know how this is done. And then I think, okay, great. But does it help in any way? Can you repro reproduce it or can you earn money from that? And of course they can because they don't understand everything behind it and how to do it, how to yeah, put it to life. And you're so right with that because it's easy to go on Google and grab any information you need, but then it's just that people turn into information hoarders. They don't come into the process of acting on it and really make it happen. So Ron, you are also a best-selling author and what would you say to adapt the question now would be the best process to turn from author to best-selling author? Well, um, the, first of all, I mean, the reason I'm even an author is because I have a desire to make an impact. And this is where it starts. So I, I never recommend that somebody just start to write a book unless you know that you, wanted, that you have to have a good reason for writing a book. Uh, I can also tell people that you don't make a lot of money um, selling books. Uh, mo most people don't. Uh, and somebody said to me, Ron, why do you write books? Because I'm just on my uh, fourth manuscript and um, I've already got the fifth manuscript also done. So he said, well, why do you write so many books? Because there's not enough money in it. I, and I said to him, my response was, I don't write books to make money. I make money so I can write books. And that simply means I have a desire to share insights with people. And there's a lot of people that I'm personally not going to be able to reach in my lifetime. And they're not going to be able to afford my mentorship services. So I've got this up. I say, well, okay, how can I touch people in Asia and Africa, people that will not be able to afford my services in many cases? So that's why I write books. Now, going from a, a book to best-selling book, really the question is why do you want to be a bestseller? Is it to get your books in the hands of many, many people? Well, this comes down to one thing. You've got to be good at selling and marketing your services. No matter where you are, you can be the best at what you do. But if you can't market and sell, you will still not be able to make the impact. And so one of the things I, I, and this is what I teach now, I go, well, what are the main contributors to success? Number one, you've got to know who you are. Number two, you've got to understand how your mind works. Number three, you've got to have a strong desire for what you want in life. People that don't have desire don't make it big. You've got to have ambition. You can't take somebody that has no desire and give them motivation because problem is that problem with that is we only have limited reserves of willpower. So willpower doesn't take you all the way. It only takes you a short way. And so if you don't have a lot of burning desire inside of you and you don't know what you're passionate about, you're not going to sustain yourself on the journey. And that's why it's so important to know what makes you come alive, what inspires you, what is the thing that you would do for free, what is the thing that you do that makes you lose all concept of time, where you get so engrossed that you forget what you're doing. That's what is in your zone of genius. Everybody has a zone of genius, but majority of people will never discover it. Because they're not seeking it. So what happens is so many people find occupations and careers and jobs that are not in line with their zone of genius. And so what happens is they work too hard for too little. They, have, they make very little impact. They make very little difference. And, and, and they never reach their potential because they don't ask themselves the important questions first. So... If somebody said to me, Ron, how can I write a best-selling book? I would say, well, first of all, what do you want to write about and why do you want to write it? Second of all, I would say to them, find out exactly who you're writing for. Don't write for everybody. Keep a picture of the person in mind that you're writing for. I had a lady recently who reached out to me. She said, I'm writing a book, but I've got this block. I don't know what, how to write. I said, just picture <laughs> that you're speaking to somebody, one person. What do they look like? What is their name? How old are they? What did they do for a living? And come, come up with a complete idea of who you're talking to. And then when you write that book, you, you pretend that you're only talking to this one person. That's how you come up with a great book. And then once you have written that book, you have to come up with an amazing title. Very, very important. It's interesting that and they did some research and they found that there was a cookbook written which only sold two and a half, two and a half thousand copies. When they changed the title, it sold 150,000 copies. The content was still the same. We're constantly told not to judge a book by the cover, but most people do. We look at the cover and we make a decision whether we're going to buy a book or not. So don't make the mistake of writing a fantastic book and then coming up with a crappy title. You've got to make sure that the title is very compelling and it's appealing for the person that you wrote it for. That's really important. It's not appealing to everybody. It's just got to appeal to that person. 
So one of the other things I say to people is if you're going to become a best-selling author is you be prepared to polarize some people, which means you can't have opinions and views that sit on the fence. Be okay with offending some people by what you stand for because the moment you strongly stand for something, by default you stand against something. And when you stand for something, some people are not going to like it. And if you want to please people, you'll never make it big. So don't worry about pleasing people. Please the people that you're trying to serve, not everybody. So, and then, of course, as I said to you, you've got to become a very good at marketing and sales because once you've written a great book, you know who you're writing it for. You've got a great title. You've got a great cover. And you're prepared to polarize people. That still isn't enough. You've now, now got to know how to market and sell your book. And for that, you've got to learn some marketing and selling skills. You've got to promote it. You've got to be very, I always say that if you're not okay with self-promotion, you're not going to make it in the world of business, no matter what product or service you're selling. So I had a lot of reservations myself once upon a time. And I thought to myself, geez, if I am promoting myself, am I selfish? Am I egotistical? Am I greedy? But then I realized that I could not serve anybody until I promoted myself. So I made peace with the fact that the best way for me to serve my market, the people that I want to help, is for me to stand out first. But I was not standing out to serve myself. I was standing out to serve others. And that's a key distinction you've got to make in your mind. So you can make, you've got to make peace with that. Because if you don't make peace with that, you will hesitate in standing out and you will hesitate in promoting your work. And if you hesitate in promoting your work and you don't back it up yourself, others aren't going to back it either. Hmm. <clears throat> yeah, there is so much great advice and valuable advice in that, what you're saying, Ron. And it brings us back again to thoughts and beliefs and to work with the mind in the right way. So what would you advise would be the best start to learn how the mind works? Well, I think nobody has really fully understood how the mind works, but there are some things that everyone unanimously agrees with. And that is, well, first part everybody says is that, well, the mind has different components and that you have a subconscious mind, which is much more powerful than the conscious mind. So as I'm speaking right now, you're listening to my voice and your conscious mind is engaged. Your unconscious mind is keeping you alive. It's keeping you breathing. It's keeping you blinking. It's keeping your blood flowing. It's doing all of that without you having to worry about it. That part of the mind is the part of the mind that is responsible for your results. And that part of the mind is where your habits, your values, your beliefs, and your self-image reside. So what happens is a lot of the times people consciously desire something. So they say, hey, I want to be rich. But they have this unconscious belief that says rich people are greedy or they're bad. So they want the money But they have this belief that having money makes you a bad person or people who have money exploit other people. So now you have a belief that contradicts the desire. And ultimately, between the desire and the belief, the belief will always win, which means that the moment you come close to making money, you're in the proximity of a money-making opportunity. You will either become inattentively blind and not notice that opportunity Or if you do notice it and you do something about it, somewhere you're going to sabotage that opportunity. Why? Because your mind will not allow you to do something that is inconsistent with your own hidden beliefs. Same thing with self-image. If I see myself as an average person, an average husband, an average dad, I'm not going to do the things that I need to do to become a world-class entrepreneur because average people don't act like world-class people. So what is my self-image? And the self-image is how do I see myself? What happens is what people don't realize is that how you see yourself is more important than how other people see you. And soon enough, once you're convinced that you can be the person you want to be, other people start to believe it too. Eventually, people start to accept you on your own evaluation of yourself. But majority of people see themselves as not great. They look at the current circumstances, they look at the current income, they look at the current occupation, and they let those things decide their self-worth. Whereas I always say to people, your occupation, your net worth, your self-worth will not change unless your self-image has changed first. You have to see yourself a champion way before you become one. That's what Serena Williams did. That's what Floyd May Mayweather did. 
That's why people like Muhammad Ali, if you look at people in sport, you look at business leaders, they became champions in their mind long before they became champions in the real world. So one of the issues with that is that most people live from the outside in. They look at the current circumstances and then they let those circumstances decide how they're going to feel. And the problem with that is that they're living from the outside in. The hardest thing in the world is to convince your own mind about something. That's the hardest thing. Forget about convincing the world. Can you convince your own mind that you can be a champion? So if you can change your own self-image to see yourself as the person you want to be, not as the person that you are, you convince your mind to be that person. Soon enough, automatically, your thinking, your feelings, and your behaviors will change to coincide with the new self-image that you have created. It will happen automatically, but you've got to change that image first. Yeah, that, that makes so much sense. So what would you say, Ron, would be the best way to do that? Like visualizing yourself being this new version of yourself? Well, that's part of it. But again, that's a tactical solution. The first thing is you've got to ask yourself, what do I really, 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 really want? Okay, and that should be not be defined by what is possible for you. Just first decide what you really, really want. So when I decided many years ago that I wanted to be uh, an international speaker, I wanted to be a best-selling author, I wanted to be a world-class mentor, there was nothing in my reality that would suggest that I could be any of those things. There was nothing in my reality to suggest that I could have a global business, or I could do this, or I could do that, all the things that I'm doing right now. But the first thing I do, right before I set my goals, Before I visualized, I became extremely clear on what I wanted. And I made sure that what I wanted did not come from my head. It came from my heart. Because your heart doesn't lie to you. The head lies to you. So I said, I said, okay, the, and I said this today. I was interviewed in a podcast today, and I said the same thing. I said, the dip, most difficult journey that you're going to make is the one from the head to the heart. That is the most difficult journey you're going to make because we are conditioned through the professional world and through the academic world to apply a lot of our intellectual thinking. But most of us don't realize that our heart also has a lot of intelligence. Our heart already knows what we're good at. It already knows what makes us come alive. It already knows what our natural inclinations are. So if you follow your heart first and then go, what do I really, 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 really want? That's the first step. Then you write down in detail. In, on a piece of paper, you write down exactly what that looks like. What do you wear? How do you look? How, what kind of influence do you have? What kind of money do you make? What kind of lifestyle do you have? What do you do for work? What does your day look like? And you write that in vivid detail. Because the first thing is you've got to give your mind some clear instructions as to what you're looking for. The clearer your instructions, the more effectively your mind can work. So you start to go, well, this is who I am. This is what I want. I get up in the morning and I, I wear this kind of clothes and I drive this kind of car and I go to work. And people treat me like this, and this is what I'm doing, and that's what I'm doing, all of that sort of stuff. You write down in detail, and you start to feel, is it inspiring you or not? If it's not inspiring you, you rip up that piece of paper, you throw it in the bin, and you start again. Until you really start to feel a strong level of inspiration. Once you've got that, that's what you really want. And now you're starting to create your self-image in vivid detail. Now, all you have to do is first thing in the morning when you wake up, and your conscious mind is weak and drowsy, you need to read that. And then last thing at night before you're going to bed and you're starting to get tired and fatigued and your conscious mind is starting to become weak, you then read that again a few times. What you're trying to do is you're trying to take the, the, the self-image of the ideal person that you want to be and you're trying to bypass the conscious mind and plant it straight into the subconscious mind because once you have done that successfully, your subconscious mind will ensure that naturally your thinking, your behaviors, your physiology your alertness changes to coincide with the new self-image. Very, very powerful. That is really powerful. It's almost like a magic secret, what you described here, to changing lives. So, and it also, to come full circle, means what you said in the beginning, like clarity leads to power. Be really clear on re what you really want. So absolutely. And, and it's been said, and it's been said, you know, our Buckminster Fuller, who was considered one of the most intelligent men on the planet, when he was asked, you know, how what made him so powerful and so intelligent, he said three words, clarity is power. And you have to work with clarity. Most people don't have clarity. I can tell you, you can say to a person, well, what do you think about wealth? They can't tell you much. They don't know what success is. They can't tell you who they are. 
So they don't have clarity. They think they have clarity. But if you ask them a question, they will not be able to answer with precision and precise detail as to what they're looking for. And so the problem is a confused mind makes bad decisions. And that's where you have to start. You've got to understand that the situation you're in, your job you're in, the partner that you're with, the place where you live in, the income that you have is a byproduct of the decisions you've been making. And if you don't have clarity of mind, what kind of decisions are you going to make? It's no wonder that people end up in situations and events with people in the types of lifestyles that are not suited to them because they have not been making the right decisions. And why have they not been making the right decisions? Because they don't have clarity of mind. Yes, yes, that is really so powerful and goes really deep. So, Ron, because we talked about beliefs, let's talk a little bit about influence, because I think this is also a topic a lot of people have negative beliefs around it. And in magic, magic for entertainment, it is used, of course, to distract the attention from the audience and also to get people to do some specific things on stage to make an illusion working. But also it's like what you said with marketing and selling. So you have to be good at marketing and selling. But I think myself, you also have to To be good in influencing other people, to pitch them something, to sell them something, to get them on board with your idea, your project, your company, whatever. So what would you say is your take on influence and how is it best possible to influence other people in a positive way? I love the way you tie everything and use analogies to relate it back to magic. I love the way you do that. That's, that's, that's just so, um, so amazing that you do it. Now, good question about influence. It's interesting that I have picked all the topics that people misunderstand. I'm constantly having to uh, provide perspectives to people because most people are unconditionally, uh, they're conditioned to, sorry, un unconsciously conditioned to see success see money and influence as negative things. And it's no wonder that uh, majority of the world, when it, when it comes to the number of people that are millionaires in the world, it's only 2% of the population. So only 2% of the population have a net worth of 1 million US dollars outside their family home. And that tells you, it's very, you can see the correlation right there. Because all the skills that make you wealthy, influence, understanding your mind, success principles, all the stuff that actually makes you uh, wealthy and successful in life, People have Most people have negative beliefs around. And that comes from a misunderstanding of what influence is. So influence in the most simplistic definition is how many people know you, like you, and trust you. That is the simplest definition of influence. Now, what you're talking about is persuasion, which is different. Persuasion is only a very small part of influence. But influence is a lot more than that. Now, you can't – a lot of people think now here is – we were talking about how people don't have clarity – The reason why a lot of people think persuasion is bad is because they don't know the difference between persuasion and manipulation. So persuasion is really motivating somebody to do something that's good for them and good for you. Manipulation is getting somebody to do something that's good for you, but not for them. And so these are those little places where people don't make distinctions. So if, for example, if I got you to do something that you ordinarily wouldn't do, But I got you to do it anyway, but it really benefited you. Did I do something wrong or did I do something right? You see? So most people will go, oh, I don't want to be persuaded. But what if you had demonstrated the inability to make good decisions for yourself? Now, I know that that sounds a bit arrogant. But if you look at majority of people, you look at the five key areas of life. Peace of mind. How many people have peace of mind? Good health. How many people have good health? Financial security. How many people have financial security? Inspiring careers, how many people have inspiring careers, right? Good relationships, how many people have good relationships? Five fundamental areas of life. Most people stuff it up. Most people at least have two or three or maybe four or sometimes all five areas completely out of order. So those people who have demonstrated an inability to not make good decisions over a long period of time sometimes need to be persuaded for them to do something that is good for them. Now, you think about it, right? You might go, well, but people are smart enough to do that themselves. Are they really? Well, if that was the case, why is the fast food industry one of the fastest growing industries in the world even now? Why does Coca-Cola still sell and make a, why is it a billion dollar company? Why does alcohol and tobacco sell so much? Why are people still killing people? Why, where, why is there human trafficking and sex trafficking and drugs and violence in the world? That's because most people have not evolved to the level where they can make the right decisions for themselves. 
Now, this is not me looking down on people. This is not me being disrespectful. But it's fact. It's the fact. Uh, we've been around for, you know, 200, 300,000 years as a species. But we still have not been able to overcome the most basic problems of humanity. What does that tell us? Technology has evolved, but have humans evolved? In many respects, we haven't. So sometimes I will talk to a person and persuade and influence them to do something that they ordinarily wouldn't do. But I know I'm getting them to do something that will benefit them. And so if I've done that, does that make me a bad person? What do you think? No, I think it's really helping them. It's all with coaching and mentoring. And it's like you are showing them blind spots and taking them in directions they can't see for themselves with the standpoint they have at that very moment. And I think from your perspective, you are helping them to evolve the mindset and open up a new, let's say, magic door to show them something else. And it's good for them in the end. I think it's really about the small distinctions, as you mentioned already there, to decide what's right and what's wrong. And it comes again down to the beliefs someone has. And it's about creating new beliefs for them. And I'm pretty sure in the, in the end, when they look back, they can see what you have done for them. Exactly right. And look, a lot of people don't like being persuaded because they think they're being tricked. But it's not about tricking. It's about showing them something that they're not seeing. It's about showing them what's in their blind spot, right? And sometimes persuasion, that's what persuasion involves. But influence is a lot more. Influence is actually about, and today I say that your influence and your reputation is more important than your occupation and your, and your salary. And the reason for that is we're in the social economy. We're not in the information economy anymore. And so if, if I can give you some examples of how my influence has helped me, for example, through my influence, we have been able to raise funds for a charity. For, through my influence, I have been able to attract Uh, venture capitalists. Through my influence, I've been able to build teams and I've been able to create, create communities. Influence is so important today. But most people have no idea. And I always say, I have this saying, I always say, without influence, you're going to work too hard for too little. It's one of the best kept secrets of success. But the first thing is, you've got to get over your negative associations with influence. The influence means my ability to be able to uh, lead people. How many people know me, like me, trust me, and are willingly going to follow me? Not follow me because their salaries depend on me, but how, how many of them are willingly prepared to follow me? Now, for me to become influential, I have to understand a few things. Influence is not built quickly. It takes time to build influence. And before you can build influence, you have to create a lot of value for people over a long period of time. You can't give something to somebody today and expect influence tomorrow. It doesn't happen like that. So the first principle of influence is it takes time. And you have to constantly think about other people because the moment you think about your influence, you're going to fail because now you're thinking about yourself. So paradoxically, if you want to build influence, influence can't be an objective. It becomes a consequence. The objective should be value creation. You create value long enough for people over a period of time. You build a brand that makes you stand out. You are very consistent with your message and you, and, and, and you, have, and you demonstrate strong, strong character and consistency in what you do. Influence becomes a consequence of that. It starts to happen automatically. And once people trust you, then you have power because now you can build collaborative communities. One is too small a number for anyone to be able to make massive change. But once you start to create people who believe in you and believe in your vision because you believed in them, because you created value for them, all of a sudden now you have, you've multiplied the ability for you to be able to carry out tasks. And that's when it becomes really, really powerful. Yes, and it's really a good kept secret you mentioned there with the influence. And I think this is also why there are people out there who do seminars and they started to build this trust over a long period of time with maybe starting to write a book and uh, doing a YouTube channel, podcast or whatever. And then they reached a point where people pay so much money and also fly to the other side of the world just to be there, to get their energy and to get everything live from them on stage. That's true. But here's the thing. Don't just do, don't just write books and start doing YouTube because you want influence. The first thing is you, you can't bypass the most foundational step. How do I create value for people? If you don't ask yourself that question and you do all the tactical stuff at the superficial level, right, build a, build a logo, build a website, write books, go and speak. The problem with that is what value are you creating? Are you just regurgitating what's out there already? 
Are you just another me too person that wants to stand out so you can become famous and popular so you can start to sell things to people? Because you can do that, but you're not going to stand out very much. Why? Because that space is becoming extremely crowded. But there is always going to be space for people who have mastered their craft and are absolutely committed to creating value for people in the long term. That can't go away. That Those people will always stand out. The cream always surfaces to the top. In the beginning, it's going to, as, as we moved into the social economy, there is more and more and more people that are jumping in, thought leaders, experts, and there's a need for them. But there is no need for people who are just doing it for the sake of doing it. There's no need for those people. Those people are coming in for the wrong intentions and the wrong motivations. Those people will get found out very, very quickly. And then as they get found out and they just become another me too person, they're not going to be able to make the impact that they want. Why? Because they never came in to make an impact. They, all, they just came in to serve themselves. And this is where we have to be really careful. Because I know that there's a lot of people now that are selling people into the idea of, hey, you can become a rock star, you can do this, you can be on stage. And what they're doing is they're playing into the desperation of people who, are, who want to stand out. But standing out is a byproduct. It's not the objective. The objective is to create value. Greatness is a consequence. Yes, it's okay for you to want to be great, but your desire to add value must be must supersede your, your desire to become great. The greatness just follows, right? And so this is where people are, people are bypassing the principles and going straight to the tips and tactics. And the problem with that is if you build a house on a weak foundation, it can look all pretty and beautiful on the outside, but it's only a matter of time when the wind blows what's going to happen. The house is going to collapse because it was built on weak foundations. Yes, yes, that is a really good analogy to that. And I think the biggest three key takeaways from this interview are like clarity is power, learn how the mind works. And in the end, so I lost the, the red line now with uh, the, uh, yeah, create value. So create, think of what Create, create value you can create for the world. You did very well because it's not your fault at all. You actually did very, very well in capturing the essence. I'm like, you asked me a question and I've got, because I just go, for me, it's about building a picture. I'm painting a picture, but a lot of people want to think in structures and patterns. And I say to people, our mind actually naturally doesn't work that way. A river doesn't flow in a straight line. A branch is not straight. You know, so we, so the way I teach is, I give a lot of insights and people sometimes think they haven't got it, but they have because I'm not speaking to the conscious mind in many cases. I'm creating value which shifts the way people think. And that is more important to me than to give you a, a prescribed structure that you can go step one, step two, step three, step four, because that's what they've been doing in the business world for so long. And what has happened? Productivity has dropped. People are not even applying 10 or 20% of what they know because that's not how the mind works. So you'll find that I give a lot of information and I give a lot of insights. I do cause paradigm shifts and people don't even realize that it's happening. <laughs> yes, that's it. And Ron, so we could say you are also a magician just operating on another level. Wow, that's a huge compliment. I never thought of it like that, but it kind of does make sense now that you say it. Yes. So you see there, it was made perfectly sense that you have been on Pure Mind Magic today. And it was such a pleasure having you here. As I said, such a charismatic person like you I was really, really great for myself. And I also think for the listeners as well, all the value and wisdom you shared today. And we were talking about your books. I'm going to put the links in the show notes. And you also mentioned that there is a fourth and fifth book on its way to make the way into our real uh, universe or like in the real reality from your mind into reality. And You also mentioned that there are mentoring programs you offer. So what is the best page we could send people to or where is it best to connect with you? Well, the, the people can connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, which is my preferred platform. So every day, if you, if, you, if you can't afford to invest in your education or mentorship or a program and you just want some free insights, best thing to do is to follow me on LinkedIn. Um, I share value every day, right? Uh, but if you, if you want to go to the next level, uh, you're ready to invest in yourself, seriously have a bit of a structured program, be prepared to commit some time and money into it. Then I have various offerings ranging from books uh, to a program which is called the MBA of Success. Uh, and then I also have uh, 
a private mentoring programs which teach people how to become thought leaders and start businesses around their passion. So it just depends. But my, the best way is to go into my website, ronmelhotra.com, uh, or just connect with me on LinkedIn. They're the, the preferred ways for me to stay connected. But also, if something I have said that you don't agree with or it made you not feel comfortable or you even loved it, please just drop me a line. I'd love to know what it is. If you have a question, I'd be more than happy to engage with you directly as well. Fantastic, Ron. So any final words for this interview? Do you have a favorite quote you could share with us? I'll share my favorite quote. And I always say to people, if you do the things that you have to do when you have to do them, there will come a day when you can do the things you want to do when you want to do them. That's really nice. Sounds like magical freedom. So thank, thanks again, Ron, for being on the show. Let's stay in contact and maybe I can bring you back for another episode. I appreciate the time and thank you for having me on. You're welcome. Have a magical day. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for listening today. And I'm pretty sure you got some really great wisdom out of this amazing interview with Ron Maholtra from Australia and are on your way to be a more influential personality or to becoming a thought leader. Just to let you know, my book is on the way out to Amazon, How Podcasting Can Change Your Life. It is fully packed with a lot of motivation and also some secret tips around getting started in podcasting. And for the next week, I got another female powerhouse on the show. Her name is Amanda Bayerle. She wanted me to pronounce it the German way. She is from the Billion Dollar Body, which is basically for gentlemen to help them improve their life in every area. And she's also the co-host of the podcast Billion Dollar Body together with her husband. We had an awesome conversation around mindset and environment, and you don't want to miss this very high energy interview. So make sure to tune in again next Friday for the interview. And if you are in the mood, tune also in on Wednesday for the midweek motivation. Talk to you next week. Have a magical weekend. And until next time, create some magic. <laughs> <laughs>